So in this country today, we have 2.3 million people who are locked up behind bars. Right? About 700,000 of them are in jails and about 1.6 million are in prisons. That's at any given moment. Right? But we also have about 5 million people who are on probation or parole. Right? So that means there are over 7 million people who are under some type of carceral supervision in this country, which is really an extraordinarily high number. But when you add to that people who have been released, we have 20 million people who have a felony criminal record. We have over 50 to 70 million people who have some kind of a criminal record, including misdemeanors, but that can show up on job searches and housing applications and so on. So we have really what's an epidemic of people who are stained by mistakes that they've made and who are tracked and who are discriminated against and who are constantly stigmatized by our system and by our society. My name is Mark Howard. I'm a professor of government and law at Georgetown University. I'm also a volunteer professor at a maximum security prison in Maryland. And at Georgetown, I'm the director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative. The subtitle is about the real American exceptionalism. And that's actually a play on a concept that people have often put in a positive light, that the America is a city on a hill, is a shining example for the democratic world. And what I'm actually pointing to is the real American exceptionalism is actually very negative. It's a very dark, sordid uh, underground uh, of prisons that few people know about and realize how horrific they are. And when you look comparatively, compare the US to France, Germany, and the UK, when you look how the US compares to these countries in terms of the criminal justice system, in terms of the prison system, you realize that what takes place in this country is exceptional cruelty. So what I do in the book is I go through what I call the criminal justice life cycle, where I compare the US to these three European countries in terms of uh, plea bargaining, in terms of sentencing policy, in terms of prison conditions, in terms of rehabilitation within prison, in terms of parole opportunities, and in terms of societal reentry after a period of incarceration. And I go along this criminal life cycle and show how on each and every dimension the U.S. is extraordinarily cruel compared to other countries. The most shocking thing I discovered about European prisons was really how different they are from American prisons. Um, they're not places where people go to get worse, to become more violent, to become more mentally ill, to become more uh, criminalized, but actually places where people go in order to try to improve and society tries to work with them. And they're not always successful and there are plenty of problems and recidivism is still an issue in all countries. Um, but the goal of the prison system there is really to help people and to transform people. So there are many more opportunities for vocational training, for job preparation, and really to help people uh, be able to integrate successfully into society when they get out. And that's something that is altogether lacking in this country. And that's what I discovered. The contrast kind of goes in both directions. Is that the U.S. is worse than I ever could have imagined. And European countries, while they're still tough places, and obviously there's still violence within prisons, and there's still plenty of bad people who are within them and who probably belong there, and some for a really long time, but the emphasis and the goal of prison is to help people, is to make people better, and to help society overall. Whereas in this country, the goal is to punish people further, to degrade them, to dehumanize them, but then ultimately, when they do come back into society, which 95% of incarcerated people will do one day, look what we've been creating. We've been creating conditions that breed criminality, that lead to people to being asocial and unable to, and unequipped to come back into society productively. But at the same time, I think what is really crucial in underlying all of this is a completely different mindset in terms of how we treat other people, in terms of how we treat the less fortunate in our society, in terms of how we forgive people who have made mistakes. Now, obviously, there's a spectrum of different types of mistakes, and some warrant earlier release than others, but I think we need to rethink the humanity of the 2.3 million people who are locked away behind bars in this country, which is something that often gets forgotten, ignored, and they're ultimately abandoned. Another inspiration started with uh, a tragedy, which happened when I was a senior in high school and I was 17 years old, when a friend of mine, a classmate that I'd known since we were three years old, actually experienced the murder of his parents and wound up being wrongfully convicted and sentenced to 50 years to life in a maximum security prison in upstate New York. And to me, that was a shocking moment, and I actually believed he was innocent. My name is Marty Tankliff. 
Uh, I'll be turning 46 year old this year. Uh, in 1998, I was charged with the double murder of my parents. And in 1990, I was found guilty and sentenced to 50 years to life. Um, during my time in prison, I lost touch with a lot of family and friends. Uh, but I reconnected with one friend from high school, Mark Howard, who eventually got involved in my case. And um, now he's dedicated a book to me. When I was incarcerated, when Mark and I reconnected, he was a professor at Georgetown. And he knew one of the things we were looking to do is raise some new legal issues. And one of the legal issues we were raising was ineffective assistance of counsel. And how that integrated into my case is we were trying to tell a story that the prosecutors never interviewed family and friends. So one of the biggest things Mark did was he reached out to, I think it was like 50 or 60 of my high school classmates, um, which were also his high school classmates, and he posed one question to them. Did the police ever speak to you? The DA's office ever speak to you? Um, did Marty's lawyer ever speak to you? And what he did was, as a non-lawyer, he wrote a friend of the court brief, which was signed by 50 to 60 of my high school classmates that was considered part of the appeal process. If you have a family member or a friend who's innocent, first thing you need to do is make sure they have the best representation possible. If they, God forbid, are found guilty, you have to ensure they have the best representation even on appeal. But perseverance is key. And never giving up is also key. You have to continue to shine light on the wrongful conviction. You have to educate people why it's a wrongful conviction. And I think that is something that Mark Howard did extremely well in my case, is that he was able to write editorials and op-eds of from a non-lawyer's point of view of why he believed my case was a wrongful conviction. He actually took on kind of this legal role in one aspect, um, which I think actually gave him the opportunity and the motivation to go to law school. So after my friend Marty was exonerated and, and I was going through law school, I got more and more involved and invested in this issue of criminal justice and prison reform. And I started teaching at Georgetown a course called Prisons and Punishment. And one of the highlights of the course for the students was a visit of a prison, of a maximum security prison. And that was really, really gratifying and inspirational because we got to meet with a panel of inmates. But I wanted to go even deeper and understand more about prison life and experience it more without obviously going in myself uh, for a long-term stay. And so um, what I did is I started to volunteer uh, as a volunteer professor in a maximum security prison. And I started going on a weekly basis. And I've been doing this for the last three years. And I'm very, very uh, committed to the group of incarcerated men that I teach uh, on a weekly basis. And I find that I've discovered through them uh, an incredible uh, level of humanity uh, that combines intelligence, that combines creativity, good humor, hard work. They're, they're a tremendously uh, committed group of students. Few people really have the opportunity to go into a prison. When they do, they don't really want to talk about it, actually. That's one thing I've learned is that there are many people who hide their past experience in prison. And so as a result, our society, I think, is left in the dark about what goes on. And we have movies and shows that add some drama and often present, I think, a warped uh, perception of what actually takes place within prison. So for me, when I got the experience and the possibility of, of going in, first leading students on tours and then teaching regularly in a prison, I realized that this is something I want to do more and even commit my life to, which is to trying to expose the horrors of prison life and the way in which prisons are run in this country and to try to then inspire, I hope, uh, fellow citizens of this country and of the world to do something to change it. I came to this book not as a scholar who had some dispassionate object of study that he wanted to write a book about, but rather I came to it with this passion uh, for the injustice that had taken place uh, and occurred to my friend. And then as I got deeper and deeper in this through my law studies and teaching in a prison, for my care for the people um, who are locked up and who are incarcerated and who are forgotten. And so the product, it's a scholarly one, but it also has a great deal of, of personal connections to me. And it's one that I'm incredibly passionate about, one that I'm very committed to, and that I've really reshaped and rededicated my life to. And what I would hope is that readers of the book get a sense of that passion and get mobilized and motivated to reform the horror show that is the American criminal justice and prison system.